Julio Carvalho first encountered the Spiritist Doctrine when he was about 14 years old. Since then, he has become an active participant in the United States Spiritist Movement, has co-founded the Spirit Center Divine Light in Newark, New Jersey, which he coordinates with a group of friends, and has become a prolific speaker, disseminating the Spiritist message, not only in the tri-state area, but also in the Union County Jail, where he works as a mental health counselor. Julio's topic today is Paul of Tarsus and the way of spreading Christ's consciousness. My dear friends, spiritist colleagues, and members of this distinct audience, allow me to start by wishing everyone peace in our hearts. A wise man and his disciples were walking from city to city, learning from life itself. And they approached this particular town in which they noticed this broken farm. The fence had rotten barbed wire, broken two by fours, there was a house situated in the middle of this farm with a huge crack on the wall, missing parts of the roof. And disciples looked at the wise men and concluded that obviously no one lived in that house. As they approached their house for their surprise, here comes a family, two kids, a mother and a father. The two kids, they look very malnourished as if they were starving for many days. The husband's clothes was also rotten away. And the woman, her hair was a mess. And women, you know, if your hair is a mess, something is definitely wrong. <laughs> so the wise men approached the father and asked, how is life? And he says, life is miserable, it's terrible. Do you see that cow? And he pointed to an animal that was far, far away. And the wise man says, yes, we do see that cow. Well, the entire existence of this family depends on that cow. I milk the cow, my wife, she walks the cow, and my kids, they wash this animal. And therefore, we depend on this animal. The wise man looked at him and said, I'll see you in about a year. He walked with his disciples towards that animal, but the animal kept walking further and further away. And when they actually met, they were so distanced from the house that they could barely see the family. The wise men looked at, at his disciples and said, friends, do you see that cliff? And they said, yes, we do, master. Well, I want you to push the cow over the cliff. Are you out of your mind? Are you crazy? Didn't you just hear the family saying that their entire lives depends on this animal? Don't question me. Just push the cow over the cliff. Now you got to picture this image. The poor animal is just trying to fight for her life. Meanwhile, all disciples are dragging this poor animal and they push the cow over the cliff and unfortunately, she stumbles to her death. One year passes by and here comes the same wise man with his disciples towards the same little town, but now completely new fence over the farm. There was green grass and actually plantations of rice, beans, corn. And the house, its walls were perfectly fine. New roof. And of course, the disciples concluded a different family bought this farm, fixed it up, and threw the old family out. As they approach their house for their surprise, here comes those same four members. But now, the kids had book bags with them, noticing they were going to school. The father had brand new clothes, mustache was done, and the woman, pretty Jess, with her hair due. And the wise man looks at, his, at the father and asks one more time, how is life? And he says, well, Life is going great. And he said, how come? Well, coincidentally, when you were here the last year, our cow disappeared. 
We had nothing to count on. So I sold anything I could, and it was barely enough to just to make ends meet. And I bought some seeds, and little did I know that the ground was so fertile. And from there, I could plant beans, corns, and rice. And before I know it, I had enough food for our family. But the ground was so rich, the soil was so fertile, that I was selling to people around my farm. And as I sold those seeds and corns and beans and rice, I had enough money to fix the house, bought more animals, and hence, life is great. The wise man looks at his disciples and concludes, the problem with the majority of us in life it's not because we aim so high and we miss it. It's because we aim so low and we hit it. We're saddled for less when we're capable of much more. And to me, it's my honor to be speaking here today where so many people do not settle for less, aim high and achieve it. As it was for a woman named Rosa Louise Mackley Parks, on December 1st of 1955, the bus driver James tells her that she must give up her seat to a white passenger, and she refuses to give up her seat. It was early that afternoon, and she gets arrested for it. An uncommon preacher in a Baptist church in Montgomery hears the news, and it's time to do something about it. We cannot settle for less when we're capable of much more. They arrange a boy scout, and on the following Monday, they had the entire African American community contribute to the boy scout. And the buses, which was written, written by the African American community, were completely empty. And that boy scout lasted for 13 months. And how could people get to their jobs? Well, people walked. They walked. Some people arranged to have the African-Americans taxi workers to pick up the African-American people for the same wage. But the government fall back and said, there is a minimum wage that you can write on taxes, and that would not be the bus uh, wage. And they increased, so people arranged now carpools. So they helped one another for 13 months. But for Dr. King, on his autobiography, he says that the epitome of this fight, not against any race, but the fight of, against injustice. Because he said that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. He mentions that one day a car pulls. It's approaching this old lady that it's walking towards her house. She was carrying some grocery bags. The driver looks at her and says, Ma'am, you don't have to walk to your house. I am in the system of carpooling. I could take you home. And she answers, I am not walking for myself. I am walking for my children and for my grandchildren. What these people have in common is the willingness to sacrifice. And that's what Paul of Tarsus did. He sacrificed. Even before he knew Christ, he sacrificed himself to dictate, to spread, to disseminate a message that he loved. But of course, he was on the wrong track. But the intensity of his love for truth was the same until he started the persecutions because he wanted to kill Christians. On his mind, he thought they were doing a disservice to humanity. So on his ways to Damascus, as you have read in the book, Paul and Stephen, he sees a light, and on the blink of the light, the horses that is being ridden makes him fall, and he falls into her knees. And in that moment, a light reaches the iris of his eyes, and he sees Jesus for the first time. And he asks, who are you? And the beloved master says, I am Jesus, the one that you persecute. Not a single question, 
No confrontations of any kind. Just one plea. What is it that you want me to do? And Jesus says, continue on to Damascus, and there you will know. The light goes away, and he's completely blind. His servants takes him to a poor inn. And there, Ananias, the man that he wanted to kill, is the same individual who restored his vision after three days of blindness. He starts speaking of Christianity in the near synagogue. Now, the same energy of sacrificing love for the truth is converted to a different message that he now understands it's the better one. But of course, they wanted to stone him to death because whenever you bring something new that actually makes people question their own interest, don't expect them to love you. Expect stones. Expect them to belittle you. If you're expecting an easy work to disseminate the Spirit's message, you are at the wrong place. This is hard. It requests sacrifices. And that's what we have taught from these masters. That's what we have learned. So he goes into a desert, and there he works for three years constantly, trying to develop a plan to disseminate Christianity. After the three years, he goes to, the, to Jerusalem, and there, on the house of the way, he tries as well to preach Christianity. He goes to the near synagogue that once received him as a doctor, but now he was the madman who had extracted Christianity, and they wanted to stone him to death. So Peter tells him, go ahead. You have to make yourself a plan. You have to reorganize yourself. In here, they will kill you. So now his last hope is to actually seek his father on the city of Tarsus. And when his father greets him, he says, I heard you're mad, and now that you're healed. And he says, Father, I was never mad. I found in Jesus the messenger that all the prophets told us about. And the father also kicks him away. He's not accepted by his own family. Gives him a little pouch of money. And now he goes with no north trying to get a glimpse of what he had to do in order to disseminate the message. He had the truth. He had the way, but no plan. So he goes near the city of Tarsus into one of the caves, and there he falls asleep. On this sleep, he gets into a dream, and in a dream, he spiritually disengages himself from the body, and he meets the first martyr of Christianity, Stephen, and his beloved betrothed, Abigail. And he says, how can I know the design of Christ? And she gives him one word, love. But even when we love, it's hard to develop these divine feelings in ourselves. What we have to do, she gives her a second word, work. And then he says, but even when we work, when we love, the results are not what we expect. And she says, hope nevertheless. Wait. Well, beloved Abigail, sometimes we work, we love, and we wait. But there are those who want to persecute us. There are those who want to harm us. Even those amongst that understand the same language we're speaking of, they persecute us. What should we do? And she says, you must forgive. He wakes up from this dream, which was actually a spiritual encounter with his beloved. And now he had a plan to love, work, hope, and forgive. So he buys a tent, a loom, in the same city that he was born. And every day he worked and worked and worked. He went to his loom, loving everyone and everybody. And he did not create any state of anxiety because he wanted to do his will. He just waited for the call of Christ. And also because he was well known as a preacher, as an athlete in his country, in his city, those who now sees him as a mere humble weaver calls him a madman, the crazy man, and he forgives them all. So he puts into practice the plan. He loves everyone. He works, he waits, and he forgives. Because Paul of Tarsus did not want to settle for less when he was capable of much more. Three years passes by, 
and Barnabas comes from Antioquia to invite him for the work. And that's how it starts. The story of Tarsus. And it's because of this man's sacrifices that now we have Christianity as it is. If it wasn't for Paul of Tarsus, we the Gentiles of the world back then wouldn't know the message of the heavens. To love, work, wait, and forgive. To disseminate this consciousness into spiritism, we must love spiritism. And what is to love spiritism? Is to know spiritism. If we are attending a spiritist center for X amount of years, and we still haven't read the books written by Alain Kardec, if we don't know the works of Andre Luis, if we haven't read the message of Leon Denise, we are still on the position of those who are just there to receive and not to give. But blessed are those who have learned to give because they will receive. So we must love spiritism in that sense. To know how can I love and disseminate a message that I don't know. Alain Kardec, in question 798 of the Spirit's book, he asked the highly evolved entities if spiritism will one day be a worldly known message or it will be limited to a few amount of people like ourselves. And the highly evolved spirits stated that everyone on the planet will know about spiritism. Because spiritism, it's part of the laws of nature. But there will be many battles. And these battles are not fought against conviction, but rather interests. People will be easily convinced by this message. I know that most of us around the world can easily understand what, we're being, what is being said here because it's founded on logic and reasoning and we are highly rational individuals. But the Spiritist message asks us to do very hard things, to choose sacrifice instead of pleasure, to choose what is best for me, not what I like, to choose what's hard, not what's easy, to choose spiritual evolution instead of material possessions. That's the difficulty of the message. Our institutions alone are completely driven by greed. Our school system is driven by greed. When you see a guidance counselor, he is fast to ask you which profession you want to go to, to because these are the professions that the most money are there waiting for you. Even our religious institutions are driven by greed. When you hear the testimony is given to other religious institutions, what you hear, blessed are those who have, because those who doesn't have, God doesn't love them. The testimonies are usually around these lines. Before, I wasn't blessed. Satan had me. But now I'm driving this nice car. I have this beautiful home, so God has blessed me. It's around material possessions. So to give up those material possessions for a greater cause, it requires lots of sacrifices. And if we want to love this message and see the message being spread around the world, we also should make our own sacrifices to give of ourselves. Yes, to give of our material possessions, but our youth as well. Paul of Tarsus gave everything that he had, and most importantly, he did not survive of Jesus. He served Jesus, because wherever he went, he used to be a weaver. As a result, he worked for his own existence. So wherever kind of work that we do, that is referring to Christ, to spiritism, we should not make any profit out of it. Because if we do, it's just another profession. Those who call themselves atheists, that is one of the mainstream criticism. It's not science that creates the atheists. It's the religious people who doesn't leave their message. They preach one thing and they live the other. It's a billion dollars business if you are enrolled in any religion institutions. 
So if we want to spread this message, we must sacrifice ourselves. Spiritism should come first in our lives. By the way we live in our entertainment, in our families, in our work, by living the message, by becoming a better husband, a better wife, a better brother, a better co-worker. So those can see that we are living letter of Christ being sent to their hands. But we must work and work and work hard and wait. We should not work expecting the results. You plant the seed, the results belongs to God. In California, there's a place called Death Valley. And it's called the Death Valley because nothing grows over there. It's, 300, it's located 300 feet below the sea surface. And as a result, the air is so dry that no plantations of any kind is possible. But in the 1990s, there was a volcano eruption and it changed the atmosphere around Death Valley. And before people were prepared for this, photographers from all over the world came to take pictures of plants, of flowers that are growing on the Death Valley. No one had planted those seeds. Where did they came from? They were already there. But they were waiting for the right conditions in order to be blossomed. So you will sow the seeds. It's the responsibility of God to make the flowers blossom. But make sure you plant them well with your sacrifice, but not settling for less, but for wanting more and giving more. And if there is one thing that we can give, and that would be the fourth plan given by Abigail, it's forgiveness. You forgive. On December 2nd of 2006, the world was struck with the gun shooting in Pennsylvania at an Amish community. But they were also very surprised that on the following day, the Amish community were speaking about forgiveness. Some family members buried their children and went to the funeral of the shooter who shot their kids. But not only that, on the following day, they decided to create a fund to help the widow in order to teach forgiveness to the world. But their definition of forgiveness is the same as spiritist definition of forgiveness. When you forgive, you're not changing the actions. When you forgive, you're not absolving the individual for the responsibility. When you forgive, you are liberating yourself from the prison of hatred. When you forgive, you are giving yourself an opportunity to be free again. When you forgive, you give yourself life. Because according to William Shakespeare, those who hate, they drink the poison expecting the enemy to die. And obviously, we don't want no one to kill ourselves, especially if that person is us. This is why we should forgive. Not to settle for less, but to aim so high. Martin Luther King Jr., the beloved Martin Luther King Jr., changed the country's consciousness in a moment that they most needed. And he was killed because he had the more courage to take a stance on injustice. He was influenced by Mahatma Gandhi, who was also killed because he had the more courage to take a stance on what he believed in. Christ was killed. And of course, in your attempt to disseminate this knowledge, there will probably no one to shoot you with a gun, but they will belittle you. They will scorn you. They will disrespect you. They will make fun of you. Don't settle for less. You aim high and achieve it. If you settle for less, unhappiness will set within you. It's only our choice 
to make this doctrine of love and knowledge as powerful as we disseminate it by the amount of sacrifices that we give into it. That's what Martin Luther King Jr. said. A woman and a man is measured not in times of peace, but in times of trouble, in times of disbelief. We are living in a time of disbelief. And more than ever, the world is hunger for peace and love, and we should give it. Just like this boy in a city in Chicago, he said that he wanted to become a doctor and he was 11 years old. His mother had no money, so he went around selling newspapers. And one day he was so hungry and thirsty that he knocked on the door and this little girl who was also 11 years old came to greet him and asked, what is it that you want? He says, well, I want to become a doctor, but for now, anything to eat would be excellent. And then the little girl brought him a glass of milk. She gave him the glass of milk and he poured that glass as if it was a whole banquet. And then he searched on his pockets and looked for some changes to give it to this little girl. And she says, I am so sorry. My mother told me that I could never ask for loving actions given to other people. Now this little girl had just nourished his soul. He went on to sell his newspapers and he became this great shot doctor in the city of Chicago. And one day as he entered the hospital, he looks at the files and see there is someone that lives from the same city that he was born. Could it be possible? There were so many other hospitals around his city. Why that hospital? And as he entered the room to check who the girl was, it was the same little girl, but now a grown-up woman. And she had a rare disease. And he says, I'll do anything in my power to heal you. And after four months, three operations, she was completely eradicated from her illness. But then the bill came. Now, for those of you that have gone to a hospital and took a Tylenol, once you see the invoice, the headache comes back. So as the social worker was going to deliver the invoice, the doctor said, let me see it to check these numbers if they're right. And the poor woman was at the room waiting for this invoice saying, oh my God, I will probably spend the rest of my life trying to pay this bill. I, just, I think I'm gonna get sick again. <laughs> it's better to die. And the doctor was checking all the numbers and the operations concluded and medications delivered. He wrote some notes and told the social worker, go ahead, you're free to go. And she delivered that invoice and this woman, it's making the additions and she's not even half of the way and it's adding already more than a half a million dollars for her stay at the hospital. And as she continue going at the bottom lines, she trembles and then where it says total, there was a huge zero. And the zero said, flip the note. She flipped the invoice and there was a message. Invoice paid in full many years ago with a glass of milk. That, that it's all it takes. A glass of milk, a helping hand, a smile, a positive thought, Vibrations of love so we can change the world. Not through much from speaking, but rather from living. This is why the highly evolved spirits come again from the afterlife to write to us, to remind us that our purpose here in our lives is to give of ourselves. We are here temporarily. And for those of us that has more knowledge about what we should be doing in here, once we get to the other side, guilt, if we didn't deliver our responsibilities, will kick in. 
They come from the afterlife and rights through the hands of mediums like Chico Xavier in order to describe to us the purpose of life and to let us know don't settle for less when you're capable of much more. You are not created for disgrace, but rather for sublimation, for supremacy of your own imperfections to achieve the grandeur of evolution. This is why Castro Alves came through the hands of Chico Xavier to write a poem in which he summarizes our evolution and our purpose entitled March On. And as we close the curtains of the Sixth Spiritist Symposium in Atlanta, let this day be just a seed that has been planted into our minds, into our hearts, so we can be productive and do our part in the construction of the world of your generation. March on, says Castro Alves, because life has its mysteries and compassing laws of beauty, which compels us to evolve. From God we emanate, multiple forms we reincarnate, longing for perfection and love. In humanity we seek the truth from the myth, yearning for peace and evolution. We cause in our path multiple lives and deaths, victims of our own disillusion. From the eternal struggle, building ourselves from the rubble, we learn ways to overcome. Despite the pain and misery, nevertheless, we grow ceaselessly from darkness to dawn. From the raindrop, a plant reaches the top, triumphant at last. The root appears to be gloom, but manure converts to perfume, transmutation at its best. The plant will be crowned with flowers all around, birds opera on their arrival, but flowers too shall pass. Their martyrdom is a blast for the ground's revival. From nature we are taught, work hard, that's the law. All life is in movement, sculpting through sacrifices. We'll carve blocks of vices inside a stone, lies a monument. Lessons from suffering and pain, change will always reign, even narrows, tyrants without seas. Under the law of reincarnation, through many trials and expiations, we'll too be messengers of peace. Let no one be idle. Today's angel was yesterday's Adam. Perfection is everyone's destiny. Life's purpose, splendid. God's love, transcendent. Our school, universe's eternity on earth from time to time sublime beacons of light dissipates the shadows away their presence are felt for every nurse they dwell transforming night into day never in history a sacrifice such as portrayed by Christ transpire for the sake of truth from the cross the message is heard Forgive all, always serve your pain, I will soothe. It's Socrates and the hemlock, it's Caesar's war being fought, inflaming oppression and cruelty, it's Selene and his art, the imperialism of Bonaparte, spreading domination and tyranny. It's Dr. King's, I have a dream, Lincoln's speeches never seen, the incarnation of renovators. It's the embodiment of humility. From the charitable Francis of Assisi, the gospel resuscitators. Blessed be the teachers who illuminate the seekers, inspiring virtues and light. Bliss is yours to conquer, although perfection is yonder, your progress is bright. In the entire universe, Divine heavenly verses, decrees, march on. A celestial love awaits. Have hope, have faith towards the infinite to come. Thank you, Spiritist Symposium Committee, for inviting me. Thank you, Spiritist Symposium speakers, for allowing me to be part of one of you. 
Thank you, God, for the blessing of speaking into your audience. Thank you for listening. <laughs>